very much for coming along today. Um, so we're Big Voice London working with um, the Commonwealth and England Barracks Association to be very kind to support the event today. We've got some brilliant speakers lined up for you. Uh, so I'm going to get off and in turn we're going to hear introductions from a few of our young people who are going to introduce our very important speakers today. Okay, so the first one is you. This is Ajoa. Thank you. She's also chair of the Bar Council's Equality and Diversity Committee since 2001. She's also a part of the panel of Council for Equality and Human Rights Commission, and we're very, really lucky for her to be here because yeah, she's going to sh share with us her insights in equality. you to uh, this really interesting lineup of speakers that Jennifer has managed to secure. Well done to her. You're going to hear from three very eminent people with three different perspectives on equality and the law. So welcome. They're each going to speak for about 15 minutes and at the end of that they've all agreed very kindly to take some questions. So there'll be time uh, about 45 minutes if we keep to time for questions and then at 7.30 courtesy of uh, the um, committee chaired by James Dingermans we will have some drinks uh, in, a, in a different room. So welcome to you all and over to uh, the next introducer. Court from 1st January 2009. During our faith, he was leading human rights career. President Nelson Mandela appointed him a judge in 1994. He was a powerful critic of President Mabeki's AIDS denialist policies and wrote a prize winning book called Witness to AIDS. He remains involved in many charitable and public causes. He has won prizes, honorary doctorates, an honorary fellowship at Oxford and a special award from a Bar of England and Wales in 2002 for his contribution to international jurisprudence and protection of human rights. We look forward to learning more about his work and his experience in his speech. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That's very African. I want to hear it again. Good evening. Good evening. In Africa, we say, we talk to each other, and I can ask you how you are. How are you? Very good. Well, lovely. I love the response of How are you? I'm really well, and I want, that's what I want to tell you about. <laughs> and thanks for asking back. I want to tell you a story about law. And I think it's quite a precarious story, but it's quite an exciting story, and it's the story of law in my country in South Africa. And it starts off with very bad news. It starts off with apartheid, where apartheid was a system of racial oppression. And I'm looking at you because you are black, and it was as personal as that. It was white people who came to Africa and said, our culture is superior, and our race is superior, so therefore you can't vote. You as a black person cannot vote. People of South Asian descent, mixed race descent, black people, we're going to take most of the land for ourselves, the economic opportunities. You can't, we, we are even going to prescribe who you can marry and have sex with. And if you look at Africa over the last 40 or 50 years, there have been much more bloody horrors. In the Biafran War, two million people died. In the Burundian and Rwandan genocides, a million people each time. So there have been many horrors on, on our continent, but what was specific about apartheid 
is what has brought us here together this evening, which is law. It was a legal system. It was minutely systemized. It was written up in regulations and law books and statutes, and it was enforced very carefully as a legal system. So by the end of apartheid, when apartheid was on its last legs in the 1980s, and President de Klerk decided he had to negotiate with the people who were fighting for freedom in South Africa, they had to decide what system of government would they use to replace apartheid. And for various reasons, the ANC, which was the majority party, and all the parties committed themselves to a system of law. And that is a very extraordinary thing. And I want you, as people who are thinking about the legal system in your country, in the United Kingdom, in England, I want you to think for a moment what an extraordinary thing the law is. The law, the basic idea of law is that any exercise of power can be checked, that all power is subject to the rule of law, that there are norms and values and principles and standards that are publicly known, that apply equally to everyone, and that can be accessed by everyone. That's also a very important principle for your experience of the law in this course accessible to everyone, that those principles will govern how public and even how private power is exercised. And that's what we decided to do in South Africa. In Kenya, there's a similar commitment, which I think is also so important, and I want you to hear a bit about that. I won't talk a lot about Kenya, but on the 4th of August last year, the Kenyan people adopted a, a constitution that's very similar to our constitution in South Africa. We've got a very broad and sweeping constitution. It's very much written up, unlike the constitution in the United Kingdom, which is mostly an unwritten constitution. <coughs> the Human Rights Act is written up. The European Convention on Human Rights is written up. Our constitution is very, very, very detailed. There are provisions for provincial power, for the treasury, but there's also a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights guarantees people equality guarantees them freedom of expression and association, but it also guarantees them social and economic rights. That's a very important fact about the South African Constitution. Now, what apartheid did was that it privileged a certain form of being human, which was a white skin. Shamefully. It's a shameful thing, and I, I hope that you all have a sense that it is a deeply, deeply, deeply shameful thing to judge people by their skin color or their culture or their language or the way they are. And the Constitution in South Africa committed itself to the opposite. It said we are going to do away with the inequalities and the injustices and the indignities of apartheid. We're going to create an equal society. And it's a very ambitious and idealistic project, one which may not yet work. I'm still optimistic that it will, but there are many perils for us in South Africa and Kenya and other African states that have committed themselves to the rule of law and to constitutionalism. And one of the important values in our constitution is one that I want to end off on. It's the question of diversity. From the uniformity and the subordination of apartheid, we now celebrate diversity in South Africa. We have got 11 official languages, every single language that's spoken, vendor, is spoken by a million people out of our 55 million people. It's an official language. Tonga is spoken by about the same number of people, not just the big languages, the world languages like English, but every language. We value diversity, religious freedom. And I benefited from that very personally. And I want to tell you something very personal about myself. I was a human rights lawyer under apartheid, fighting for justice and for freedom. I represented ANC, guerrillas who had been arrested. I fought against conscription for young white people. I fought against land removals. But I was also a gay man. Under apartheid, I had to come to terms with the fact that I was not heterosexual. It was very difficult for me. I'd been married, but my marriage came to an end, and I decided, at about the time I started in practice at the bar, I decided to hell with this. I'm not going to apologize once again in my life to anyone <coughs> for the fact that I'm gay. So while working as a human rights lawyer, 
I also worked for gay and lesbian equality, and we got a world first in South Africa. In our protection of equality clause, we've got sexual orientation. It was the first written constitution anywhere in the world that said that you as a gay or lesbian person would have equality under South African law. And at the end of the year in which we became a constitutional democracy, the year in which we put apartheid behind us, President Mandela appointed me as a High Court judge. It was the biggest honor I'd ever had, and I never thought I'd have it. I never thought that I could be a judge as an openly gay man. And I was deeply moved and very, very affirmed by that. Because what does it do? That appointment says to me, it doesn't matter that your sexual orientation is a variant, that it's a minority, that only three to five percent of people in London or Africa or South Africa are like you. It says we're going to put that aside as an irrelevance. We're going to let you contribute to our transition and to our country and to our jurisprudence and to the rule of law and to fairness <coughs> and justice in our, in our country. We're going to judge you, not by your orientation or your skin color or your gender. We're going to judge you by your deeds. And I find that a very, very wonderful thing. And I find that a, a powerful and strengthening thing for the law. So I come to you from Africa, which is a continent of diversities, of minorities, a, con a continent of terrible conflict. Kenya is, is riven with inter-ethnic and tribal conflict. But the rule of law offers us something else. It says to us, we will have public norms by which we will judge the allocation of public resources and the exercise of power. That's a wonderful thing, and that's why I'm so excited to be here with you this evening. Thank you very much. stand behind this if I may. Thank you very much for a wonderful introduction. I uh, didn't quite recognize myself uh, in all that uh, in what this young man has had to say about me. And thank you very much, uh, Justice Cameron, for a wonderfully inspirational uh, speech. Oh dear, this moves. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was um, very inspired by speech and I was reminded, of course, that uh, of all my achievements, uh, judge and so on, whereas nothing to my sons uh, than uh, the occasion when I met the one of those sporting heroes, Francois Pinard, uh, who came to, uh, to Belfast to uh, deliver a, a wonderfully rousing uh, address, and uh, I managed to persuade him to uh, sign an autograph for each of my sons, both crazy about rugby, and they thought that that put all any of, of my own achievements uh, very firmly into the shade. <laughs> and of course, I've been trying uh, with Morag Kolderbank, who's here uh, with me from the Supreme Court, I've been trying desperately to remember the name of the film starring Matt Damon, just as Cameron would know. I'll think of it later. Invictus. Invictus, that's the one. And I found it a very enjoyable uh, film. And of course, the sonorous tones of Morgan Freeman uh, conveying to Francois Pina the uh, impetus and, and the inspiration uh, to go on and will, uh, uh, win the World Cup. Uh, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Uh, 